By the end of the 19th century across the West, the belief in God was out and the belief in man was in. The Enlightenment had run its course. Science was bringing about technological innovation and understanding of the world at an unprecedented rate. And the reputation and the place of the church and the public square was going down pretty quickly. A lot of people were even atheists. I mean, Charles Darwin had written Origin of Species, and that explained the last thing that needed to be explained. Where did all of this diverse life come from in the first place? So atheism was pretty popular, but there were two types of atheists. One, there was a lot of optimistic atheists. This was probably the primary expression. Groups of philosophers and social scientists who believed that with the death of God meant progress. Superstition could be replaced by reason and by science, and we could move forward and solve our own problems problems without having to pray to God to do it. And we were going to do this through economics or maybe through sexual freedom or through genetics or something like that. On the other hand, you had the atheism of Friedrich Nietzsche. Now, Nietzsche was the one who was famous for saying God is dead. So he didn't want God back in the picture. He just believed that the death of God was going to have dramatic implications for a culture that had been built around the idea of God. Here's how Nietzsche put it in a famous parable called the parable of the madman. The madman jumped into their midst, he said, and pierced them with his eyes. Where is God, he cried? I will tell you. We have killed him, you and I. All of us are his murderers. But how did we do this? How could we drink up the sea? Who gave us the sponge to wipe away the entire horizon? Must we ourselves not become gods simply to appear worthy of it? See, what Nietzsche understood is the death of God is a big deal. It's almost like we took a sponge and were able to wipe away the entire horizon. He asked the question, do we even know what up and down is anymore? In order to go forward, Nietzsche believed there had to be someone who would step up and take charge. He called this the Ubermensch in another one of his writings. In other words, what Nietzsche believed that without God, there was nothing but power. So he predicted the 20th century would not be a century of utopianism, but it would actually be a century where there would be one power struggle after another. It would get ugly and it would get bloody. And that's exactly what happened. As Nietzsche predicted, the 20th century was the bloodiest in human history, and the bloodshed primarily came at the hands of consciously atheistic or secular governments, those that were trying to build a perfect world out of human reason and their own ideas about what the problems were and what needed to be fixed. If there's one lesson that should come out of the 20th century, it should be this. The next time someone jumps up and says, hey guys, I figured it out, I'm going to fix the world, we should run. Because that guy is going to bring a whole lot more trouble than he's going to bring solutions. But why? Why all the bloodshed? And why is it tied to secular governments? Writing in the year 1992, looking back over the century that had almost just been completed, Time Magazine editor Henry Grunewald gave a brilliant analysis. Here's what he wrote. One of the most remarkable things about the 20th century, he said, more than even technological progress and physical violence, has been the deconstruction of man and woman. Our view of man obviously depends on our view of God. And the ultimate irony, he said, or perhaps tragedy, is that secularism has not given us humanism. We have gradually dissolved or deconstructed the human being into a bundle of reflexes, impulses, neuroses, and nerve endings. The great religious heresy used to be making man the measure of all things, but we have come close to making man the measure of nothing. See, the reality is, without God, there is no grounding for human value. And that's exactly what happened in the 20th century. The grounding that was in the existence of God and the idea that man was made in his image was replaced in a Darwinian grounding, that we were not in the image of God, but rather we were in the image of animals. And when you tell people that they're in the image of animals and you set up social structures and governments and laws around that, don't be surprised to see that humans act like animals. In fact, we can say the legacy of the 20th century was not utopian visions, it was failed utopian visions. There's a number that we could talk about, but I'm just going to talk about one, and that is the legacy of eugenics. The idea of eugenics came out of this fundamental idea that humans were nothing but animals. And we had figured out how to breed better animals. Couldn't we figure out also to breed better humans? Well, Sir Francis Galton, who was a cousin of Charles Darwin, proposed that idea. Now, when we hear that word eugenics, we think about that one evil group in the 20th century where we saw that they actually tried to live out the suppression of other races and the advancement of the Aryan race. And that, of course, is the Nazis. But what many people don't realize is the Nazis got so many of their ideas from American elitist secularist 
intellectuals. Those who took seriously the ideas of Darwin and Sir Francis Galton and actually proposed the idea that we needed to breed better humans. If you want to lose some sleep tonight, Google this phrase, eugenics in America. Because what you'll find is there are a lot of secularist American intellectuals proposing this idea that we needed to control birth rates, we needed to control society, and we needed to weed out those who were unfit. One of the most famous is the founder of Planned Parenthood, Margaret Sanger. She thought the unfit were the poor and the African Americans. And so she started something called the Negro Project, where the intent was actually to either curb or eliminate the black population. You'll also find information about fit family contests at county fairs, where if you could go and prove that throughout multiple generations of your past that there's no impure racist or imbecility, you could win a prize for the fittest family in the county. You'll hear about forced sterilizations, the most disturbing of which was a young African-American girl in Virginia who was forcibly sterilized at the will of the Supreme Court because of her IQ. In fact, the Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes said this, It's better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime or to let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. As Edwin Black writes in his book, The War Against the Weak, this decision opened the floodgates to forced sterilizations and practiced eugenics in America. What happened in the decades to come? The Germans picked up on these ideas and they actually pulled them off. They took it to the next level with concentration camps and mass executions, but it was the same basic idea that we can fix the world through our scientific arrogance. We could go on to other utopian visions that also failed, like Marxism. Marx thought he was going to fix the world by getting rid of social classes, but he failed to recognize the inherent dignity of all people. Or, or the sexual revolution, which thought through orgasms and sexual freedom and birth control, people would just be happy and we could have a utopian vision. That, of course, didn't work either. Our sexual freedom has brought us more sexual slavery than we care to admit. What's underneath all of these failed utopian visions is one thing, a failed understanding of the human person. It is only societies built around the recognition that all humans are made in the image and likeness of God that affords them the equality and dignity that we all know that we need.